depths of shadow. The blurring threshold I leapfrog to maybe. whispered Tatiana. I'm still alive. These were her abstract thoughts as she stared like a saucer-eyed cat confronting a deluge, stared into her emerald green eyes in the large, heart-shaped crest mirror hanging above the vanity table in her bedroom suite at Hotel Bochica, Salta del Tacandama. She stopped combing her wet hair and set down the pearl inlaid ivory comb next to the pillar candle. With her fingers, she stroked the long, ebony strands over and behind her ears as she always wore it. Her silken bronze complexion implied summer and golden sunlight, but tonight it belied the winter swirling inside her. So cold, she thought. The flame of the candle wavered, catching a draft seeping in through the double doors leading to the balcony. A large fireplace set to the opposite wall crackled and flared languidly with the petty gust, radiating a forlorn warmth that seemed a million miles away. It was raining hard now, thundering at midnight. Tatiana gently flinched with each crack and growl. She had only just come in from the balcony, her nightgown as wet as her hair. The November storm seemed to be following her. Behind the hotel, the Rio Bogota was already raging over Tecandama Falls, bashing down on the rocks in explosive suicide, then reconstituting as ghostly white rabbits rushing like a fusillade of banshees south toward the Colombian rainforest. This is what a nervous collapse feels like, she wondered. Is this mirror mirror on the wall telling me I'm the most beautiful nervous breakdown of them all? Or am I just another portrait of a hollow life? The hard shape of the looking glass brought her no consolation as it had always done in her previous visits. Life had changed. For the first time, Tatiana realized that the mirror was frameless, except for whirls of fluidly cast in heavy silver at the bottom sides of upward stemming coronet. Been too much framework holding me for too long. The white plaster walls of the room felt like they were melting in on her, deliquescing and flooding her existence away. But how can I ever make a square life fit into a round hole, make new skin from my desolate bones? Like the mirror before her, Tatiana knew her structured world had become a vignette, blurring into absolute darkness and uncertainty of the edges. Again thunder erupted overhead and she tensed, remembered the waves swamping the yacht like a broken record, skipping and repeating, Mayhem, mayhem, mayhem. Slip sideways, she muttered. And run with the waves like I always do. She heard her fiance shout as he locked off the wheel of the vessel, turning the Stefania into a giant cork bobbing through the hurricane strength squall off the coast of Cartagena just two days ago. What a surprise for that storm to have suddenly blown up out of clear blue skies. Just like us, thought Tatiana, exploded. A romance ruptured and vaporous in an instant, it seemed. A volcanic ash cloud of amorous discontent and heart-rending misery. How, her voice quavered, how could he? There was no running with the waves now that she was on dry land. There was no denying the fact that Ricardo had fathered a child with his mother's personal servant, while Tatiana had been away in Paris finishing her education in fine cuisine, poetry, literature, and art history, becoming the perfect woman at Le Cordon Bleu and the Sorbonne. There was no escaping the fact that a scandal was imminent. Not even her parents would let her shy away from securing the scoundrel's name in a ruse to bolster utmost righteousness and to protect the propriety of all. Simply put, she had to perpetuate their engagement and go through with marrying Ricardo to prove his innocence of indiscretion with the help. A debutante, coffee, cocoa, and sugarcane baroness with the reputation of Tatiana Marita Ospina would never consort with a philanderer, she said coldly to the mirror. Never! She could hear her father yelling and absolutizing, branding her with his insistence of what would become public knowledge and inscrutable truth, regardless of facts. To 
too much at stake. She shivered and shunned his words now, staring at herself wet and broken in the mirror. Our family's interests must merge. You will consummate this union. I must become a lie, she realized. I must be what everyone believes I am. To hell with reality. Ricardo, why didn't I just push you overboard, you bastard? Wondered Tatiana now. The storm would have simply wiped you away. A murder, a wash with goodness and a higher ideal. Erased, she whispered. But that, she thought, would deny your eventual crucifixion at the hands of fate. Time will get you, Ricardo. And the merciless press, she imprecated. My father and his pretentious propriety be damned. Nonetheless, it was her father's control and the endless pressure of high society to save face with Shanghai Tatiana, landing her on board the Stefania with Ricardo. A weekend out on the Caribbean was a high-profile and euphemistic effort to isolate two prisoners in a floating cell, lock them away until they came to their senses, embraced the aristocratic Colombian etiquette and agenda, and embraced each other in love again. Never again, whispered Tatiana. Lightning shattered the sky above Hotel Pachica, and a blistering clap of thunder punctuated Tatiana's words. Words of resolution that had also driven her to jump ship once the Stefania escaped the raucous sea and slammed into port, the pier post cracking the yacht's hull from bow to mid starboard. It was the proverbial leap of faith that had propelled Tatiana from the rising deck to the dock before the Stefania whooshed back into the harbor, Ricardo reaching out for her from the railing and began to slowly sink. Tatiana had not looked back, didn't even look at herself or anyone she encountered in the eyes until she came in from the balcony tonight and sat down in front of the vanity mirror. She was certain her parents and Ricardo were on a hunt to find her right this moment, but she didn't care. Although remote, Hotel La Chica was a noted retreat for the rich and famous and was not hard to find. Only 32 kilometers southwest of Bogota and positioned on a precipice diagonally across the gorge from the infamous and legendary Tacambala Falls. Once again, however, life had now changed forever, she said to herself. Suddenly a ghoulish moan caught the hairs on the back of her neck, yanking her attention away from herself in the mirror. Her eyes darted up to the heavy, ornately carved beams of the coffered ceiling. There it was again. The more Tatiana focused her hearing, the more the distant, echoing groans became an ominous ranting. Wait. Is that the music of Wagner? I really am losing my mind, she thought. Dramatic classical? Am I back in Paris with Hitler stormtroopers handing out propagandist leaflets while playing innocence in jackboots on the side streets and back alleys? Tatiana had looked down on them, not only as a people, corrupt and skewed, but from her apartment window overlooking the Montmartre Arts District. I'm at the Chica, she forced the thought forced reality back onto herself. You're here at Bochica, Taddy, in Colombia, your home. Then suddenly she wondered if maybe the stories of bar fights gone over the edge on the main terrace of Bochica truly had brought ghosts to the hotel. Although in all her stays, this was the first she had ever heard anything unnerving or supernatural. Again, the ranting end. Tatiana looked abruptly from the ceiling to the bay window, hearing what sounded like the roar of diesel engines, the screech of brakes, and the crunchy whoosh of thick tires sliding in the mud, rising from the grounds below her suite in the hotel tower. Jumping to her feet, she rushed to the window and peeked out, but the exterior decorative metalwork on the rain dribbling down the glass obscured her view. Pulling the top quilt from her canopy bed, she draped it over her head and wrapped the remainder around her slender figure, then hurried to the balcony double doors. Cautiously, as if she were a child about to spy on her sleeping parents, she opened the left door. A moment later, she stepped out onto the cold, wet flagstones, tiptoed to the balustrade and discreetly peered over the edge. A large black truck and Mercedes touring car were parked below. The engines revved and fell silent.
Tatiana's emerald eyes again grew as wide as those of a saucer-eyed cat. This truly was more than an uncanny series of brooding winter storms. She had seen such vehicles more than once while in Paris. She had also seen similar ebony helmeted soldiers, like the ones now leaping from the back of the canvas-covered bed of the truck and splashing down in the puddles of the soaked earth. And she had observed countless high-ranking officers sipping cappuccinos and cognac at sidewalk cafes that were now exiting the touring car front and rear. One step from the vehicle's back left, while another hurried through the front passenger door, quickly turned, and opened the vehicle's rear suicide door. From this black hole emerged an officer of apparent superior rank. Regardless of supremacy, however, all wore perfectly tailored Stygian leather topcoats belying the monsters they were beneath. Tatiana spoke the words so many Frenchmen already feared, even though the pending war was still a rumor or myth of propaganda. Schutzstoffel, she muttered, SS. And just as her last sibilance dissolved into the trickling tattoo of the rain, as if by the magic of cliché, speak of the devil and he shall appear, this lead officer looked up directly at her, the brim of his hat dripping onto his chin and the silver death's head on his cat peak glistening like a demon's third eye. Rudolph S., she realized. She had seen him on more than one occasion, strolling beneath the Eiffel Tower in his S.A. brown shirt, offering a young girl a rose. Even me, once, she breathed more than said. She had also seen him in that hideous celluloid propaganda flaunted as Houghton Cinema that no one in France condescended to mention the name of. Hell is at my doorstep, she whispered. My front door is truly broken and bleeding guts of shadows. Tatiana recalled her abstract thoughts that were not so abstract anymore. Thunder grumbled long and low, like a bellyaching volcano in the distance, then built to a sonorous crescendo that vomited a bloom of lightning deep in the storm clouds directly overhead. The nimbostratus blossomed again, and briefly the clouds turned to smoky white cauliflower, the roiling florets diffusing the lightning further, illuminating the entire countryside and revealing 50-gallon gray metal drums being unloaded from the rear of the truck. Tatiana squinted against the blinding scene, but her eyes quickly locked onto Hess's unflinching gaze once again, and she shivered. Shivered and sunk away from the sight of the deputy Fuhrer and his mini militia and back into the safety of her room. She locked the doors, leaned with her shoulder against them, and crossed herself. Why is he here? She did wonder. So far from his beloved Hitler and in my country now, what are they up to? Her eyes drifted from one shadowed corner of a room to another. The mysterious hotel poltergeist was ranting and moaning again, the heavy-handed musical refrain of some classical composition over-smudging its words. But from where? Echoing distantly from the attics or the depths, Tatiana still could not surmise. <laughs>